I'm Nicholas de Matos. I'm a tutor and a student in uh, the School of Philosophy and Economic Science. Now, um, there is a line in the Isha Upanishad which says, whatever lives is full of the Lord, claim nothing, enjoy, do not covet his property, then hope for a hundred years doing your duty. Now, in so many ways, without knowing it, a modern eminent scientist fulfilled this injunction, not least in the fact that he died aged 100 just two weeks ago tomorrow. He gloried in the name John Goodenough. And here he is. And what I hope to demonstrate to you today, with the help of the Times obituary, is that in so many ways, John was indeed good enough. Um, we have over the last four or five years spoken uh, about many people on, in this slot. And as a start, John is indeed good enough to be included in this small hall of fame of ours. I'm not going to belabor his name, you'll be pleased to know. But when I recount to you his life, whatever, uh, whenever he comes up against a challenge, just remember his name. So he was born uh, in uh, Jena in eastern Germany in 1922. His father was Erwin Goodenough, and uh, here's a, a picture of him. Uh, an American academic uh, at the time, a PhD student, at Harvard Divinity School, uh, who was probably engaged on research in Germany at that time. John was dyslexic, but he says that because of that, he didn't read very much at school, but he learnt to love nature. He made himself butterfly nets so that he could cycle out into the country and uh, catch uh, butterflies so that he could get up close to them and, uh, and study them. Uh, he's the younger of the two boys. He found a dead skunk one day and out of curiosity skinned it, getting himself temporarily banned from the household in the process. One can surmise that John's father, now professor of the history of religion at Yale University, didn't think much of his younger son's prospects. And in spite of the fact that pre-war tuition fees at Yale were $900, sent him there to study mathematics with only $35. He swore then that he would never take another cent from home and kept to it. During his undergraduate years, uh, he earned the money for his meals and won a scholarship for his tuition. His old headmaster at the Episcopalian boarding school at Groton, Massachusetts, arranged for him to tutor the sons of wealthy parents during the summer holidays. So he qualified in 1944 as a mathematician. But you get the impression that in spite of apparent limitations, John Goodenough did not feel limited. From mathematics, he felt free to branch out into whatever area of maths or science was needed. So uh, during the war, he served with the US Air Force as, uh, 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 as a, a meteorologist. Um, and there he is. Uh, and this, he was based in the Azores. After the war, he studied for a master's degree in physics at Chicago University and rubbed shoulders with Enrico Fermi, uh, the uh, founder or the, the inventor of the uh, first nuclear reactor. And John Simpson, who had co-led uh, the... Um, the, the, uh, the development of the atom bomb, which ended the war. Every apparent hurdle that John met, he either jumped or obviated in some way. His master's tutor was uh, Clarence Zenner, who, um, was, uh, who had invented a diode, which became a critical component of modern electronics. The Zenner was not very helpful. At their first meeting, he said, now, you have two problems. First, you have to find a problem, and the second is to solve it. Good day. In those days, university halls of residence separated male and female students, except for meals. 
he made good his opportunity, met and married Irene Wiseman, um, a Canadian history student. Um, he said, I tried to write a poem for my wife every birthday and every Christmas. We shared very much a vision of Christianity, so I would always write something of that nature. It always had a religious bent to it. His next 24 years were uh, uh, spent as a research scientist developing, amongst other things, the first practical high capacity memory for digital computers. In 1976, he and his wife, who had by this time become a professor of history, applied for posts at Oxford. Again, it's a mark of the lack of limitations in the man that though he was by training a mathematician and by experience a physicist, he applied for a research post in Oxford's inorganic chemistry lab. He won the post, but it was a controversial choice. Uh, a PH student at Oxford at the time um, called um, uh, Russell Edgell, and, and uh, here he is, uh, told the magazine Chemistry World there was a sense of scandal in the inorganic chemistry community outside Oxford when an American physicist was appointed. The more discerning inside Oxford argued that he was the first of a breed of scientists called interdisciplinary. When he won his Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1987, his joint winner, uh, Stanley Whitting Whittingham, there he is, um, said of him, Recognition has come hard for him because the physicists don't really think he's a physicist and the chemists don't really think he's a chemist. Another aspect of John which saw him through his long and happy life was his sense of humour. As you may know, an academic's life is teaching and lecturing as well as research. I used to think that it was rare to find one who could do both effectively. Uh, uh, now, at this point, I'm going to close the window because the dustbin men have just come. Hang on a second. It's such a sunny day that I, I seem to crime to close the window, but there we are. <laughs> oh, where were we? Uh, yes, so uh, lecturing um, was not John's strong point. Um, sorry, uh, here we are. Um, John's lectures would invariably become very technical and his students would either fall asleep or cease to attend. Claire Gray, uh, who later became a, a, a professor of chemistry at Ch Cambridge, told uh, Chemistry World that she and her friends took pity on him once and filled rows two to three of the lecture hall with cuddly toys. John was highly amused, commenting, at least the bears managed to stay awake. As you will have heard um, uh, 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 in the news at various stages, Oxford was in the business of retiring academics, and John, now 65, was in line for compulsory retirement. I fled, he said, and took up a research post at the University of Texas, wanting, as he put it, something to do. And around that time, electrical engineers who were developing the mobile phone wanted a lightweight rechargeable battery. Remember the first mobile phones in the 1980s and 90s? Huge great things. Uh, um, you remember, uh, remember them being shown in films like Layer Cake, um, in great things like that with, with, uh, with aerials. Um, in fact, we've got a picture of one here. Um, if I can add it, there we are. I, remember, I think I had one uh, a slightly fractionally later model, uh, still with the aerial, um, uh, which I just about fitted inside the inside pocket of my jacket, uh, which once fell out with a great splosh into a bucket of water. And I had to fish it out and uh, dried it in the airing cupboard and, and it still worked. I don't think that would happen today. 
So John got together with Stanley Whittingham uh, and uh, Akira Yoshida from Japan um, and experimented with lithium cobalt oxide, developing the first lithium ion battery, which uh, revolutionized modern electronics by enabling gadgets to be very much lighter and smaller. In his 90s, uh, John Goodenough was still doing, go, going into the lab to work, not only on weekdays, but also weekends. What at, you may ask? Well, he wanted to go further. How do you make lithium ion batteries safer, he asked. How do you make them last longer? And he followed this with, with this quote, which you can see uh, in the chat. I know that we live in a throwaway society and they don't like to make things last too long. But I like to make things that will last a long time. I don't believe in a throwaway society. I think we need to preserve Mother Earth. Typical of him is this exchange just after he'd received his Nobel Prize for chemistry. He was asked how he had benefited financially from lithium ion technology, now worth billions of pounds. I don't really care too much about the money, he said. The lawyers always end up with the money. He famously didn't have a mobile phone and had to be searched for to be told about his Nobel Prize. But he tapped his chest proudly. The ticker still works, he said. I have a lithium ion pacemaker. And uh, here, here he is uh, with uh, Barack Obama. And uh, that is the sort of the picture of him in the obituary. So John Goodenough is a lesson to us all not to accept limitations. Um, so uh, yes, we've seen um, uh, uh, electric scooters spontaneously combust. Um, and we, we've seen, we, we're worried about the um, the proliferation of uh, things like lithium ion batteries uh, 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 polluting the earth. But at the time of his death, John Goodenough was working on that. Um, he didn't accept it as a limitation. Closer to home, what are we not doing or putting off due to limitations? Um, some high achieving people are, are, are dyslexics. Sir Richard Branson is, 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 uh, is probably the most famous. Uh, there's a, a, a saying, when one door closes, another opens. Uh, and that was a, a quote on the pin board in my parents' kitchen for years. And eras come and go. Um, if an era is passing, it's best not to hang on to it or try to recreate it. Um, it it's much better to recognize the era that has, has come uh, and enjoy that for what it is. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, this is uh, the last um, uh, uh, Philosophy Live talk um, for this summer period. Um, and we return in, uh, I think it was uh, late September or, or October, but. Uh, We'll keep you posted on that. Um, please uh, like it and, um, uh, and, and share it. Have a very good day. And remember, no limitations. <laughs>